Thank you, Lee. I appreciate it. Um, God, I was bored hearing about all that stuff. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you all uh, for coming this afternoon. And I want to be sure to thank Lee and everyone from Prairie State College and the Homewood Science Center who have been so gracious, have shown me such hospitality. It's been an absolute pleasure being here. And I've been looking forward to this and, and to this evening uh, with um, great anticipation. We had a great lunch with about 15, 16 students. Um, for those of you who are there, there will be a quiz later. So um, I figure you're used to that. Uh, as Lee said, I, I've, I've been with NASA for almost 36 years now, and I've worked, I've worked on a lot of projects. But right now, NASA is moving into an area that I think is the most exciting thing that NASA has ever done, and that is including the Apollo missions to the moon, and that's including the construction of the International Space Station. It's actually beginning the process of establishing humanity on other places in the solar system outside of Earth. And as I call this presentation, what we're starting to do is leave the cradle. And I, I chose that title specifically. It's a quote from a gentleman by the name of Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, who said, the Earth is the cradle of the mind, but we cannot live forever in a cradle. Konstantin Tsiolkovsky published hundreds of works about spaceflight about the design of spacecraft, about propulsion systems, about space stations, about what astronauts would need to survive in space, what you would need to do extravehicular activity outside of a spacecraft. And he published all of these before the Wright brothers' flight at Kitty Hawk. His work was responsible for later work done by Robert Goddard, who patented liquid fuel rockets he built on Tsiolkovsky's work. Tsiolkovsky himself never finished school. He was deaf. Therefore, his teachers didn't think he could ever amount to anything. So everything he achieved, he did it on his own because he knew what he was capable of. And there's an equation called the Tsiolkovsky equation, which we call, in simplifying terms, the rocket equation, which tells you how a propulsion system is going to perform. And that equation is still the basic performance equation that we still use today. So he started talking about spaceflight that here over 100 years later, we're just beginning to realize. The International Space Station. We've had a continuous human presence in Earth orbit since 1998. The space station we reached assembly complete in 2011. It weighs approximately a million pounds in Earth orbit. It's about the size of a professional football stadium. You can see it when it passes overhead because of its size and the light that it reflects from the sun. This is a starting point for humanity leaving Earth. When we send humans to Mars, the spacecraft is going to be very large. We're not going to launch it from Earth. We're going to assemble it in space, just like we assembled the space station. We did the space station. Therefore, we know we can assemble a large spacecraft. Crew members are going to be gone from Earth for years at a time. Crew members now spend at least six months on space station. So we know we can tackle the problems of long duration space flight. So this is the first stepping stone that is going to allow us to cross the river to Mars. Right now, the station is resupplied by Russian Progress spacecraft and spacecraft from the United States, one by Northrop Grumman called Cygnus. These are used to carry cargo to station. And then they take basically the garbage from space station and bring it back and allow it to burn up in its atmosphere. Japan has the H-2 transfer vehicle, which does the same thing. SpaceX Corporation has their Dragon cargo vehicle, which is the only vehicle that can actually return cargo to the Earth. And it is the only vehicle that is, of course, then reusable. The only way this planet has of sending humans into space right now is on the Russian Soyuz 
spacecraft. This is a spacecraft that they have been flying since the 1960s. It has undergone modification since then, but it is still the same very basic spacecraft that it was in the 1960s. Shortly, though, we'll be able to launch astronauts from US soil. SpaceX company and Boeing, working under the NASA Commercial Crew Program, are developing systems to carry US astronauts. SpaceX is the crewed Dragon, which has already had a test flight without a crew to the International Space Station, successfully docked with the station, unloaded cargo, re-entered, and was retrieved. In the next few months, a crew will be launched to the space station on board the crewed Dragon. Later this year, Boeing's entry, called the Starliner, will also launch on an uncrewed mission to station, followed by a crew transfer to space station. Both of these are capable of carrying up to seven crew members to space station and returning them to Earth. Another company that was receiving funding from NASA but no longer is, is Sierra Nevada. They took a uh, NASA concept for a small winged space plane that NASA was developing and then abandoned. They took the rights to it and continued the development of it and call it Dream Chaser. It will also be able to carry seven people. It's a smaller version of uh, a vehicle like the space shuttle. It's a lifting body concept. It will land on a runway and be able to be reused. NASA stopped shuttle flights in 2011 after 30 years of flying the space shuttle. Um, the reason being is that given a fix to NASA budget, if we were going to start doing anything with sending humans beyond Earth orbit, we had no choice but to give up the space shuttle. And that's what's led to commercial crew development. The idea is to turn over low Earth orbit operations to commercial companies who have the experience base, who have the knowledge base now to do those operations. And NASA will then buy services from them rather than being responsible for the launch vehicles and the spacecraft themselves. But over the last decade, NASA has been working on the successor to the space shuttle, which is the Orion spacecraft. It has been referred to in the past as Apollo on steroids. Apollo carried three human beings to the moon and back. Orion will have the capability to carry a crew of seven. It will have the capability to do long duration space flight, many, many weeks, not days that Apollo was used to. Uh, it has the capability for reuse, although that is not planned at this point. The Orion spacecraft will have, like Apollo did, a service module that is going to be provided by the European Space Agency. Um, it will have a launch abort system, as Apollo did, a tractor rocket that can pull the crew capsule away from the launch vehicle if there's a failure or an emergency of some kind. The United States has never had to use such a system in any of its human launches. Unfortunately, the Russians have had to use it on two occasions. As a matter of fact, the, uh, the current crew to the International Space Station that just launched on a Soyuz was the same crew that was involved in an altitude abort of the Soyuz launch vehicle when one of the boosters on that vehicle did not separate properly and actually punctured the core stage. The escape system pulled the astronauts away at an acceleration of about 20 times the force of gravity. And that crew just relaunched on another Soyuz to the space station. Now, one thing is true of all of these vehicles. They all have to be tested. And they have to, to assure that they can carry crew members, that they can survive the rigors of launch. And what you see in this picture is the SpaceX Crew Dragon, their payload fairing. You see the uh, sections of the escape system for Orion. You see engineering models of both the uh, crew module for Orion as well as the service module for Orion. These are all going through what we call shake, rattle, and roll. We vibrate them, we yell at them in an, acoust in an acoustic chamber, we subject them to hot and cold temperatures that they're going to see in space to make sure they can survive all of those environments. And all of these vehicles are tested at the same facilities. That's the NASA Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio. We maintain a facility out near Sandusky called Plumbrook Station and the Space Power Facility. 
This houses in the dome you see in the middle of this picture, the world's largest vacuum chamber, which is 122 feet tall, 100 feet in diameter, and can be pumped down to a vacuum in eight hours. We can also put hot and cold panels in there to simulate the two to 300 degrees Fahrenheit that a spacecraft is gonna see when exposed to the sun in space, or 200 degrees below zero that it's going to see. We can expose it to vibration levels that they, the spacecraft will experience from the launch vehicle. We can expose it to the sound pressure levels that it will see. The space launch system that will carry Orion will generate, it is, it is a, a expected a sound level of 163 decibels. That is higher by hundreds of times than if you were standing next to the engine of a 747 operating at full throttle. It has to survive that environment. So we test them for those environments. Uh, many of you may have already seen this facility, as a matter of fact. How many of you saw the first Avengers movie? Okay. You remember the beginning of that movie, the dark energy facility? That was filmed at the space power facility at Plumbrook Station. Um, so when they were actually climbing um, down a ladder to this facility, they were climbing down the access ladder that was on that dome coming down to the, the large access doors to it. In addition to Orion, NASA is developing the Space Launch System. This will be larger, more powerful than the Saturn V that took astronauts to the moon. Uh, this will be capable of sending approximately 30,000 kilograms of mass to the moon. It'll use solid rocket boosters, similar to what were used on the space shuttle, but these are larger boosters. Uh, it will use uh, space shuttle main engines. At first, some of the same engines that flew on the orbiters, then later redesigned versions of those engines. There are cargo versions of this vehicle, and there are crew versions of this vehicle. The, uh, the first flight of this vehicle with an uncrewed Orion spacecraft will be sent on a free return trajectory around the moon sometime in 2020. This is all part of the path that we'll be following. Starting in low Earth orbit, turning that over to commercial industry to operate for NASA, going to the moon, starting with small landers, working our way to larger landers, working our way to human-rated landers, and eventually establishing a human outpost on the lunar surface where we can process the lunar regolith, the lunar soil, to extract oxygen and water and metals that we need, and actually do manufacturing of all of the components that we need on the moon rather than on the Earth. And once we know how to do that, we'll move on to Mars and we'll be able to do the same things there. We can process the Martian atmosphere, which is carbon dioxide, to extract oxygen from it. If we add hydrogen to it, to the carbon from that carbon dioxide, we can create methane. And methane and oxygen make great rocket propellants. We can also create water. We know from the robotic missions that we have sent to Mars over the decades that there is a lot of water on Mars. It's frozen into the polar caps. It's frozen into the soil, into the, the polar regions. There are even areas near the equator of Mars that from high resolution photographs appear to be dust covered glaciers. We'll find out when we start sending more humans there. But the resources that we need to establish human outposts on both the moon and Mars are there and waiting for us. The first steps for doing this on the moon are small landers. And a number of companies have actually won competitions for NASA and will be beginning to start delivering very small payloads to the lunar surface in the next few years. This is Lockheed Martin's concept of what they call the McCandless Lunar Lander, which is part of the Commercial Lunar Payload Services Award, as all of these are. Mast and space systems, deep space systems, a company called Astrobotic which is based in Pittsburgh, has two landers, the Griffin and the Peregrine lander, and they even have a small rover which they call Andy. It's named after Andrew Carnegie. 
innovation space has the Nova Sealander Draper Labs, which is part of MIT, which has been part of NASA since NASA's been in existence. They've done a lot of work for NASA. A company called Moon Express. And then a company called Firefly, which has developed a low-cost small launch vehicle, which will help send a lot of these landers to the moon. NASA won't be building these rockets or these landers. They'll be buying these services from commercial companies. So the path starts with small landers. We'll then go on to medium-sized landers carrying more cargo, carrying technology demonstration missions that will be needed for in situ resource utilization and such. And then we'll move on to human landers. The goal is to begin to establish the first human outpost in about 2028. As part of the stepping stone approach for going to the moon, NASA will be establishing what we call Gateway. Gateway will be in a very unique lunar orbit. It will basically be surfing along gravity boundaries between the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun. So it will use very little propellant to be able to stay in its orbit. The um, Gateway will be utilized to enable human missions to the surface with reusable landers that will rendezvous with Gateway and the Orion spacecraft carrying astronauts to Gateway. They'll be able to take those landers down to the surface, come back up to Gateway, get back in the Orion, and come back home. Be able to do science missions, both on the lunar surface and in lunar orbit. Um, it will demonstrate technologies that we need, both for survival on the moon and for eventually going to Mars. The first element of this is the power and propulsion element. It will consist of four to six large electric thrusters, each of which will take 12 to 15 kilowatts of electricity to operate. They'll be powered by arrays that will generate uh, energy from sunlight, equivalent to what is generated off the International Space Station, which is nearly 100 kilowatts of power. Uh, the responsibility for this element, the design, the build, the test, the launch, rests with the Glenn Research Center in Cleveland. Habitats, there are companies out there that are designing habitats that will be presenting them to NASA, and NASA will down-select one or more of those that will eventually become the habitat module for the Gateway platform, and could perhaps become a surface habitat as well. A number of companies are already coming up with large lunar lander concepts to carry humans, some of which are completely reusable. This is Lockheed Martin's concept for a reusable lander system. Um, it would take astronauts and cargo down to the surface from Gateway and then come back to Gateway uh, and can do this mission many, many times because it will be able to be refueled at Gateway. This lander is a direct predecessor toward a concept Lockheed Martin has for a reusable Mars lander. They've taken the Gateway concept and extended it to Mars using a reusable lander based from what they call a base camp, which would be similar to Gateway and be in orbit around Mars and act as a way station. Again, bringing cargo and astronauts to the station, sending them down to the surface from that Gateway. So this is, these are just like stepping stones in crossing a river that we're looking at building. And it's an incremental approach to getting there because of the cost involved and because of the safety implications involved. In addition to these and the other vehicles that I talked about with SpaceX, and uh, if, if the schedule still holds at 6.30 Eastern time today, SpaceX is supposed to be doing the first operational launch of their Falcon Heavy launch vehicle. Um, which is capable of, uh, of placing almost um, 70,000 kilograms into low Earth orbit. Um, they plan on uh, trying to retrieve, to land all three of the boosters from that launch. So if you get a chance to, to see it, I know it'll be streamed on the internet. Um, please watch it and keep your fingers crossed. But SpaceX is working on the successor to both the Falcon 9 and the Falcon Heavy, which they call the Super Heavy. It used to be called the BFR, and the F did not stand for Falcon. 
Elon Musk makes no bones about the purpose of this vehicle. It was referred to in the past as the MCT, the Mars Colonial Transport. It is his intention to establish a human outpost on Mars. This vehicle will carry a crewed spacecraft on top of it called Starship, which will be designed to carry up to 100 people with the goal of colonizing Mars, sending robotic vehicles there to establish an encampment ready for humans to live out their lives there. Um, this will be an immense vehicle. It'll be powered by 27 engines on its first stage, uh, brand new engines called the Raptor, which have only recently been fired at flight durations and have performed very well. But in addition to doing missions to space and to Mars, he also intends to use this vehicle as a passenger vehicle to get you from one place on Earth to the other. So instead of it taking 18 hours to fly to Australia, it might take you a half an hour. Because what you will do is ride this suborbital, land at your destination, refuel it, it'll come back and land at its destination again. As we move out into the solar system with humans, and as we move even further out into the solar system uh, with robotic spacecraft, you know, sunlight falls off. So to generate the power we need, you have to have larger and larger solar arrays until it becomes impossible to have solar arrays as big as you need. NASA is looking at nuclear fission power to provide power needs for both human outposts and for these robotic missions. NASA has only ever done one nuclear fission power system. It's still in orbit around the Earth. It was launched in 1965. NASA has done nothing with nuclear fission since then. In 2015, a team from the Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, along with folks from the Department of Energy, got together to design a very simple nuclear fission power system that could provide heat to power Stirling converters to generate electricity. And they created this reactor and did a laboratory experiment that showed it functioned as intended. And this entire program cost $18 million to do it. The reactor design is incredibly simple. It can be scaled to provide one kilowatt to 10 kilowatts of power. So for human outposts that may require 40 or 50 kilowatts of power, you fly four or five of these. They're shielded to protect electronics. They're shielded to protect humans. Higher power systems can actually be buried to shield humans even more from the radiation environment. And we're looking at developing this laboratory experiment into a flight demonstration that we will place on the lunar surface in approximately the 2026 time frame to show that it can indeed provide power in that harsh environment on the lunar surface to do what we need to do for human exploration. Providing the one kilowatt of power, of course, when you think of a nuclear reactor, you're probably thinking of a very big system to do this. This is the conceptual design of that system. It's five feet tall. It's a foot and a half across at its widest point, and that's the radiation shield between the reactor and the Stirling converters. This can provide a kilowatt of power. A 10 kilowatt system isn't that much bigger than this. In fact, it won't be any taller. It'll be heavier and it'll be wider, but it won't be any taller than this. So it'll be very easy to package. The reactor for this system that you see here is about the size of a roll of paper towels. Not very big at all. Now we're not the only ones, of course, who are doing exploration with the goal of establishing human outposts on the moon and Mars. China has a very aggressive lunar exploration program. In 2007, they sent the Chang'e 1 spacecraft to the moon to do high resolution mapping. And in October 2010, that was followed by Chang'e 2. In addition to the moon, it actually did a flyby of an asteroid so it could test their deep space communications network. Chang'e 3 was a lander. It carried a rover that came down in 2013, which explored across the lunar surface. This was the first rover to actually survive the two week long lunar night. 
you know, when we talk about, the, you, you may have heard the term the dark side of the moon. There is no such thing as the dark side of the moon. Whether it's the side that faces Earth or the side that faces away from Earth, it sees two weeks of sunlight and two weeks of darkness. The reason we see one side of the moon is because the moon revolves on its axis one time every time it goes around the Earth. It's tidally locked with the Earth. So we only see one side of it. There's a lunar far side, but there's not a dark side. And just last year, the Chinese were the first to land a rover on that lunar far side, the side that we know very little about. Uh, they had to place a small communications relay in lunar orbit so they could communicate with the rover, but it too is still continuing to operate and it has survived several day-night cycles on the lunar surface. In the future, they're looking at lunar sample return missions, um, expected as sometime in, in 2020, returning samples from the south polar regions of the moon, and eventually mapping out resources in the polar regions of the moon, and looking in the future, possibly in the 2030s, at the beginnings of a lunar outpost. We know more about the moon now than we did from Apollo. We know that there is a lot of water on the moon. In the polar regions of the moon, in craters that have never seen sunlight, there's water frozen into the regolith. There are compounds, even in the equatorial regions, that are very high in hydroxide and hydroxyl compounds, which we can process to extract water. And the same thing is true on Mars. There's a lot of water on Mars, frozen into the soil, frozen below the soil, and frozen water on the polar ice caps of Mars. So we're beginning the process of leaving the cradle, of extending the human presence beyond Earth. And that begs the question, this is stuff of science fiction, isn't it? This, why are we doing this? And it boils down to the fact that this planet on which we live is a finite resource. No matter how much we conserve, we're going to eventually run out of natural resources. The fossil fuels that we've enjoyed are, will probably run out in the next century or so. We can only process metals and recycle them so many times before their molecular structure breaks down and we can't recycle them anymore. We're already starting to run out of sources of bauxite ore, which is the primary ore where we get aluminum from. But places like the moon are very rich in bauxite. They're very rich in titanium. So we have other resources. And the Earth is, is threatened. It's threatened by man himself, and it's threatened by nature. In 2013, many of you may remember a meteor fragment that exploded over Chelyabinsk in Russia. It was about a 60-foot diameter piece of an asteroid with an estimated mass of about 13,000 kilograms. So that's about 28,000 pounds, it's about the size of a house. So it's actually small. That's why it wasn't detected. We don't have the capability to detect objects that size, that small. It entered its atmosphere uh, at a grazing angle at over 40,000 miles an hour. Due to its high velocity and the shallow angle of attack, uh, it exploded in an airburst around 20 miles above the ground. And that explosion generated a cloud of dust and gas and surviving fragments, which in turn hit the ground. The total energy of that blast was estimated to be about 30 times the energy of the atomic explosion over Hiroshima, Japan in World War II. It was undetected before it entered the atmosphere. And these are photographs that were taken of its entry and burn up and explosion in the atmosphere. About 1,500 people were injured on the ground from secondary effects. The blast causing glass fragments actually caused some buildings to collapse. And over 7,000 buildings were actually damaged by the shockwave. Let's suppose this same scenario occurred over New York City, over London, over Moscow. Think of how much more damage could be done. Think of the damage that could be done if this hit the ground. In 1908, a larger asteroid fragment exploded over Tunguska in Siberia. 
It flattened and destroyed a forest for over a thousand kilometers around it. The earth is a target for all of these pieces of flotsam and jetsam that are left over from the formation of the solar system. It's not a question of if one of these is going to hit a population center on the earth. It's a question of when. We're playing a crapshoot. And the best way to assure that we minimize the impact to humanity as a species is to become a multi-planet species. And that is what we're looking at doing right now. What NASA has accomplished in the last 60 years was considered science fiction 60 years ago. What we're looking at doing now may be considered science fiction now, but it will become science fact. We're at that fork in the road. And as the poet Robert Frost said, two roads diverged in a wood. I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. And that's going to make the difference for humanity, because we're starting to take the very first steps, leaving the cradle of Earth and moving into the solar system, and then wherever our desire and our technology can take us. That concludes this part of my presentation. I was going to, next we'll talk a little bit about NASA careers. Um, if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask, if you're all still awake, wake up in the back, come on. Um, please feel free, or you can catch me afterwards and we can talk. No questions. Either did, oh, there's questions. Yeah, right down here. Um, it, the, um, uh, the part of the moon that faces the Earth feels a stronger gravitational pull. So if you look, um, there are areas of light color and dark color. The darker areas are referred to as the mare, the seas. Those are basaltic rocks. Those are lava rocks. Where the, the other lighter areas are highlands. They bombarded with meteorites. Um, you have a lot more of the lighter materials. Whereas the far side of the moon, those mare don't exist. It's more of a uniform dark gray color. And because those mare don't exist, there are significantly more craters on the far side of the moon than there are on the Earth-facing side. And one of the theories of the creation of the moon is that when, when the Earth was first formed and still in a molten state, a large object estimated to be about the size of Mars actually impacted the Earth. And the material that was thrown out into space came together in Earth orbit to form the moon. So that's why what we find on the moon is the same as what we find on Earth. And when you look at rock samples that have been analyzed by the rovers on Mars, we see minerals that we see here on Earth, because all of the planets in the solar system formed from the same solar nebula. They formed from the same material. If we didn't see similar items, that had really caused me to worry, because that meant it wasn't formed the same way the Earth was. But we see that in, in the solar system. And that means the resources we have here are elsewhere. So in a way, it doesn't make the Earth unique, but that's a good thing for humanity. I think there was another question. Yes? Um, during your presentation, you used the keyword of reusable for many landers. Yes. I'll use SpaceX as an example. Uh, every time we launch something into space, we throw the rocket away. Um, they're all at the bottom of the Atlantic or the Pacific, depending on where you launch from. So every time we launch a spacecraft, we've got to build a new rocket. Well, that's big bucks. So if you want to bring that cost down, you've got to figure out a way to reuse those rockets. NASA tried it. We failed miserably. SpaceX has succeeded. They've been reusing their Falcon 9 boosters three, four, five times. As a matter of fact, two of the boosters on this next Falcon Heavy launch are Falcon 9 boosters that have flown previously. The only new stage is the core stage on it. And by being able to reuse these, designing it up front where you can reuse it, where I don't have to go in and tear everything apart and refurbish it and put it back together again, you reduce 
how much a mission is going to cost. Because that launch service is a very large chunk of any mission cost. Um, the space launch system, for instance, will probably cost over a billion dollars per launch. Whereas if I wanted to launch something on a Falcon Heavy, and I w which can put, I think it's 72,000 kilograms in low Earth orbit. That's almost the capability of the Saturn V, almost. What SpaceX will charge you for that is 90 million. It's because it's intended to be reusable. That's a big difference. So, anyone else? I think there was, there was another question here. Yes? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, um, nuclear power plants on Earth uh, are in large pools of water to cool them. Um, there's a separate water feed through the reactor, which is heated into superheated steam. That goes to a heat exchanger, which transfers heat to other water, because that heat in the, the water in the reactor is radioactive. And then that heat goes to turbines. That steam goes to turbines, turns the turbines, generates electricity. What we will be using are heat pipes that will use liquid sodium because we're going to temperatures of about 800 degrees centigrade. So these will be um, um, liquid sodium in a, a, a tube of stainless steel that's in a vacuum. So as that sodium absorbs the heat, it expands, goes up the tube to transfer the heat to the hot end of those Stirling converters, which makes those Stirling converter pistons go back and forth to generate electricity. That consumes some of the heat, and then what's left over will then be channeled to another system, a radiator, to get rid of the waste heat, which will cause the sodium to cool and go back down into the reactor. So it will be a continuous loop. So yeah, we'll be using liquid sodium heat pipes to transfer the heat. Yes, that's correct, molten sodium. Anyone else? Yes. So we've done a wonderful job with our plan. So she said that sarcastically. I hope everyone knows that. <laughs> uh, what about the moon and Mars? Are those what the longevity? You mean if we continue to be as stupid as we are now? Yeah. <laughs> and we can only hope that humanity can learn from its mistakes. That that's that's the best that we can do. Um, when you look at the differences here that keep governments separate, and you look at the crews on the International Space Station, who are from the United States, from Canada, from Russia, from Japan, from a lot of other countries, they're all working together. You know, as, as I've said, I think the leader of every country should be required to fly in Earth orbit and look down and see that those boundaries that mean so much to you don't really exist, they're human contrivances. They're, they're self-made boundaries. They're not important. The only importance we have is the importance that we seem to put on them. Just throw them away, because they don't really exist. And if there's one thing I found out in 36 years in working with folks from other countries, and that we're more alike than we are different, that there's no question. So we can only hope we learn from our mistakes and not carry the baggage with us when we, we move off this planet. There's a, uh, a poem I read years ago that rapidly became my favorite, and you can all look it up. It, it's by Ray Bradbury. It's called, If Only We Had Taller Been. And it really talks about why we want to send humanity out into space and establish. It's basically to, to make us immortal. Uh, it, will, it will continue our existence beyond, beyond Earth. Um, it's, it's a marvelous poem. Um, I suggest you look it up, do a Google search for it. Uh, if Only We Had Taller Been by Ray Bradbury. Anyone else? Okay. Oh, one more. Yes, sir. Realistically? No, I work for the government. I don't do anything realistically. <laughs> Fifty years isn't long enough. NASA's been in existence for 60 years. If, if, if I look at, at this as the bank of a river being the Earth, and I'm going to cross these stepping stones to get to this bank over here, 
which is the nearest star, Proxima Centauri. And you look at where our technology level is at right now. What we have done is stick our toes in that stream and find out it's really cold. That's what we've accomplished. We, don't have, we do not have the technology and the capability right now to send humans to Mars. NASA adverse, I'm going to throw this over my shoulder for a minute. NASA says the 2030s for the first humans to Mars. No. We may send humans on a flyby mission, a Mars orbit mission, and bring them back but to land. No. No. But technology is not going to be ready. 2050s? Maybe. The technology to get us to another star system doesn't exist. We're not even close to it yet. With the best propulsion systems I have today, I could send a 100 kilogram spacecraft to Proxima Centauri. I could do it with today's technology. Proxima Centauri is 4.3 light years from the Earth. It would take that spacecraft only 43,000 years to get there. You know, we launched Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 in 1977. It took them 40 years to cross the boundary of the solar system into interstellar space. They're about 20 light hours from Earth. At the speed they're traveling, even if they were directed to another star, which they're not, it would take approximately 200,000 years for them to reach it. We're just starting. So 50 years, 500 years, yep. maybe, assuming we survive. Yeah, so 50 years, because that time we're at the higher. <laughs> 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 I'm doing what I'm doing so your generation can continue this work. And you will do the work to inspire the next generation, and so on, and so on, until we finally get where we want to go. That, that's the key to all of this. We've just started. This is, this, is, this is barely in its infancy at this point. So we gotta, we gotta keep it going. Yeah. You'll be around beyond the 2050s, trust me. <laughs> Anyone else? All right. Oh, is there? I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, yeah, there, there are a lot of effects from the sun. They've crossed the, you know, the plasma boundary, basically the outer boundary that's created by the sun, its magnetic field and the charged particles that come off it, and have, have crossed into interstellar space because we saw this big upswing in particles and then the drop off. So we know they've crossed that boundary. Um, there have been anomalies in their trajectories that have actually been traced back to, believe it or not, the heat that is being rejected by the spacecraft actually causes a force on the spacecraft that is nudging its trajectory ever so slightly. But over 40 years, it's enough that when we look at what we predicted its trajectory to be and where it is, there's a difference. So that tells us for long-term space missions, we got to take things into account that we may not have had to worry about before. So it's a learning experience as well. You know, the, the spacecraft has survived as long as they have because they're nuclear powered. They're, they're powered by um, radioisotope power systems, uh, the heat from the decay of plutonium pellets uh, through thermoelectric converters to generate electricity. But they're wearing down. Uh, in the next five to ten years, uh, we basically won't be able to communicate with them anymore. They won't have enough power left. Right now, the uh, energy of the radio transmission from the Voyagers that's received at the Deep Space Network is one six trillionth of a watt. Yet we can still talk to them. Anyone else? No? Okay. Um, let me, uh, we started a little bit late, and if I Go from the start time, I got about 15 minutes here. I'm going to try to talk about NASA careers a bit. You 
You know, there are a lot of different careers in NASA, some of which you may not even consider. Um, engineers, of course. There are engineers that uh, work to test systems and analyze data. Uh, they work with other experts in their field to apply that data. Then there are design engineers who design systems. They design aircraft, they design spacecraft, they design structures, etc., that are used as part of a larger project. People who study materials. We've got to build a spacecraft out of something. Given where the spacecraft is going, what it's supposed to do, what's the best material to build out of it? Because we have yet to invent unobtainium. Um, a systems engineer, which is what I am, has to look at the big picture. Has to make sure that all the systems on a spacecraft or an aircraft are talking to each other, that we're taking all the right constraints into account. As I put it, I have to be dangerous to all of the other discipline engineers. Because I have to know at least a little bit about everything they need to do. Software. There's not an aircraft or a spacecraft that doesn't run on software. Uh, the New Horizons spacecraft that went to Pluto. Uh, it was impossible to control it real time because of the distance involved. Therefore, it had to point and do all of its measurements and remove its attitude and control the exposures of its cameras all by itself. And it worked. And it worked again at the second Kuiper Belt object it visited. And it's being targeted to another one, and we'll see if it's going to work again. You have to take into account manufacturing. It's useless to design an aircraft or spacecraft if you can't build it. So you have to make sure that what you're building can be made. So we, you have to involve manufacturing engineers. Then there's flight research. The Kilopower project I'm doing will do what's called a technology demonstration mission. We'll basically fly a lower power system, a scale, to make sure we know all the ins and outs and how to operate it before we go on to the big systems that are going to power humans. Same goes with an aircraft. Service engineers um, for aircraft, you got to make sure these things are flying. You got to make sure that they're maintained properly and are kept within specification. And then there are scientists. Scientists and engineers are like the opposite end of the spectrum. A scientist asks why, and an engineer asks, okay, why not? Well, the scientists come up with the th theories and come up with the laws of science, and engineers figure out, what can I do with those? As the saying goes, I know engineers, they love to change things. And that's what we do. Um, scientists typically work in, in research and development, uh, in both private and government labs, uh, and in academia. There's a lot of science work that NASA does, like New Horizons, for instance. Um, upcoming mission to a, an all-metal asteroid called Psyche. Those are led by universities. It's the, the professors at the universities who are the science team on these missions. And of course, you know, technicians. Uh, I have to have something built. A tech will build it. I need something assembled and tested. I'm going to have a tech do that. They're a critical part of the team. And that's key for everything that NASA does. No one individual is important. It's the team working together that matters. Uh, a team is always stronger than the capabilities of its individual members. Because one person can pick up the slack that another person may not be able to do. And one person may have ideas that another person may not think of. So working in that team arrangement is incredibly important. But that's engineers and scientists. How about the internet? NASA is the biggest user of the internet out there. I can pull off the latest data that came down from the Mars Curiosity rover. Science data, images, whatever. NASA has hundreds of thousands of websites. Somebody's got to develop them. Somebody's got to maintain them. So internet designers are very important. As much as we may hate to admit it, lawyers are very important for NASA. We have federal regulations we have to follow. We have contracts with companies that have to be followed. And those contracts cannot violate the law. So we need lawyers to help us with that. And even politicians and lobbyists. You know, NASA is under the executive branch of the government. We, are, we fall directly under the president. But our money comes from Congress. And we all know how well the president and Congress get along. So we have to convince Congress of what we're doing and why we're doing it and why we should spend the money that we're doing. And it takes talented people to do that. Writers are very important. If you have to be able to communicate, 
You have to be able to communicate in the written word, verbally. You have to be able to talk to your peers. You have to be able to talk to your managers. You have to be able to talk to the general public. And you may tell them all the same things, but you're going to tell it to them in a different way. As I like to phrase it, you know, if I can, if I can get my point across to a six-year-old, I can talk to my center management. No, there's really no difference. That's a tough crowd, wow. Uh, <laughs> how about artists? Um, a gentleman by the name of Bob McCall, whose murals are everywhere, the National Air and Space Museum, NASA centers. Um, they help get the aura of the impression of space flight out. A gentleman by the name of Pat Rawlings will do concept illustrations for spacecraft that we develop. And the saying is true, a picture is worth a thousand words. You can get your message a lot, across a lot better to a congressman with a picture than you can with words. Um, the picture in the lower left-hand corner, the gentleman by the name of Paul DeMar, he's done work for NASA. He's done illustrations for Astronomy Magazine, um, lots of, of magazines. He used to have studios in Cleveland. I don't know if he still does anymore, but that's where he was based out of, was Cleveland. And even music, the, uh, the artist by the name of Vangelis, composed a, a suite for Spirit and Opportunity called Methodia, which gets across the idea, if you, can, if you can put yourself in the position of these rovers being the only thing moving on the surface of a planet with the wind howling in your microphones uh, and the sound of your wheels grinding across the ground being the only thing on the surface of this world to get that idea across, that idea of loneliness. Uh, it's important. And of course, you can become an astronaut. Um, you know, for every astronaut that flies, there are literally thousands of people who support the work done by that astronaut. And astronauts come in different flavors. There's commanders, there's pilots, there's mission specialists. And these will be expanded upon, upon as we go forward um, in space. So, you know, these are the types of things that you could do and still work in the field of aerospace. For getting there, um, obviously you, you'll need mathematics. Um, you're going to need your engineering courses. But just as important as those are, I think it's more important to learn to write, to learn to speak, to learn to present like I'm doing in front of all of you without being so nervous that you can't even get a word out, because you're going to have to do it. And you could be the most brilliant scientist or engineer, but if you cannot communicate your ideas effectively, you're useless. You're useless. Taking a foreign language, I would also recommend. Um, I took German for six years, in junior high school and high school. And I was working a project with the Russians, and we worked through translators. We were taking a break one time, and um, the two Russians that I was dealing with could speak German. And they would speak German amongst themselves when the translators were out of the room. They didn't know that I understood what they were saying. And one of them just said the fact that he really had to use the bathroom. So I just turned to him and I told him where it was in German. And they turned absolutely red-faced and never spoke in German again. <laughs> you know, we work with Japan. We do work with China. We work with Russia. Learning those languages could be a real asset to you. Communications, computer skills. You know, know what's going on with, with SpaceX, with Northrop Grumman, the current missions that NASA is flying. Show that you're aware and that you understand. Um, those are probably the most important things that you can do. Just know what's out there. Now on the tables out here I have information on employment programs with NASA, uh, becoming an intern and, and, and co-ops. Uh, there's information out here on the tables uh, where you see the piles. Please avail yourself of copies of all of those. Um, recent graduates program. Um, the branch that I work in, we, we just put out for uh, four positions for my branch for uh, new graduates. Everywhere from GS7, which is bachelor's degree, up to people who have master's or who have doctorates. 
And all this information on these slides is part of the information packets that I have out there. Um, USA Jobs is the website where you can find out about information, not just in NASA, but the jobs that are available across the federal government. Uh, NASA Jobs will, uh, will lead you there and talk more about career opportunities within NASA. The One Stop Shopping Initiative for internships will list internships across NASA, all of the NASA centers. The nice thing about internship and co-op positions at NASA, um, if you get one of these positions in private industry, odds are you're not going to get paid. If you work for NASA, you become a civil servant. You get a salary. And we were talking about this a bit at lunch. Um, this is actually since um, we ended the government shutdown and, and President Trump signed the funding bill, we did get a cost of living raise. So the, this scale has actually gone up since I did this chart. But if you start with a Bachelor of Science in Engineering or in Science and you work for NASA, you typically start at grade seven, step one. And with the, this is the uh, salaries for the Cleveland area. So a GS7 step one, that is up now to almost $48,000. In addition, uh, you will earn 13 days of vacation time in a year. You earn four hours of sick leave every two weeks. The government contributes a portion to your retirement, to your health insurance, to life insurance, to the Medicare <clears throat> deduction that you have. And that's equivalent to increasing your pay by between 10 and 20%. And the other nice thing about the government, unless Congress authorizes a reduction in force, you can't be fired. You can be fired in private industry because they're out to make money. Their bottom line is their bottom line. It's not the case with the government. The government knows talent when it sees it. It doesn't let it go that quickly. Um, I've been a space cadet since I was six years old. Um, I graduated from college in May of 83. I started working at NASA in June of 83. I've been there ever since. These are some of the, the programs that I've worked on. Uh, an experimental communication satellite that we launched on the shuttle in 1993. Uh, the, the center I work at used to manage the medium and large launch vehicles for the agency. Uh, we were responsible for launching Pioneers, Vikings, Voyagers, Cassini, um, that was our, our job to do. And I was ascent trajectory lead for two weather satellites that we launched for NOAA. Um, I worked with the Russians on a solar dynamic power system. Did some hardware for the space station called circuit isolation devices. You'll see a piece of that hardware on the table out here in the lobby. That is flight hardware that was outside on space station for six years doing its job. Uh, when it was no longer needed, they brought it back on the shuttle and we got them back on the center. Um, I worked um, several shuttle missions when those were installed. We built a piece of hardware to measure the static charge buildup of the space station. And from the time we were turned on to do it to the time it was placed on the space station was a grand total of four months. That was horrendous. Um, I was project manager for a year for a program called GAPS, which was Gondola for High Altitude Planetary Science was doing planetary science missions from a high altitude balloon in Earth's stratosphere on a reusable platform carrying a large telescope. Um, I'm part of a team called Compass that does conceptual designs for different spacecraft missions. Um, currently working on the Kilopower project. Uh, I was working on a newsletter for the division that I'm part of, which I did the logo for and named. We called it the Architect. And, uh, in my spare time, um, four and a half years ago, I started a concert band at the center. It's formed of employees and retirees and family members and students from a local school district. And we do engagements at the center and also do public outreach activities. So it's important to, to do things like that. We play a lot of music that helps get I ideas of, of space flight across to people. And we combine that with, with talks as well. So you know, this is just a flavor of the different types of careers you could have with NASA and how much money you could make and 
you know, what I've done to give you an idea of what you could be doing. And frankly, the center that I work at is one of the least important in NASA. Um, we don't have the political support of, say, Johnson Space Center or Marshall or Kennedy or Goddard. They do a lot more space flight missions. Uh, I've been fortunate to work on space flight missions in my career. And I, I hope to end it by putting one on the moon. Uh, that would be the epitome for me. But uh, I made it in time. How's that? Anyone have any questions on that whirlwind tour of NASA careers? No? All right. Well, thank you very much for coming.